Today, the train symbolizes a better possible future for many in the Western world. Environmentally friendly, convenient, socially progressive, trains now represent an opportunity to undo some of the mistakes of post-industrial development. Yet a railway map of the UK from 1900 paints a startling picture. Between 1850 and 1900, the National Rail Network added between 80 and 200 stations annually. But in 1963, the British Railway Board published the Beeching Report, severely criticizing the inefficiencies of the British Rail Network. Thousands of stations and thousands of miles of track were closed in the following decades, and other countries followed suit. The world had left trains behind. Many continue to argue that all of this was a grievous error. Reform, they say, is a slow train coming. Today, abandoned trains rust in graveyards around the world, a haunting symbol of what might have been. And here are some of those magnificent beasts. Looking like something out of a Fallout game rather than an actual means of transportation, this experimental Soviet turbojet train was one capable of cruising at 250 kilometers an hour, 160 miles per hour. Originally weighing 54 tons, the ER-22 was to power a new generation of high-speed trains. The project failed due to the extremely high cost of a gas-guzzling airplane engine. The concept was tested in the USA and France, but proved loud and exceedingly dangerous to people not on board the train. This and the high maintenance cost of jet engines were the death of the R-22. It sits abandoned outside Tver in Russia, a bizarre reminder of a more hopeful age. Yet there were other trains to try and adapt airplane propulsion for rail service. German inventor Otto Steinitz developed a turboprop-powered train in 1919, and Russia's own aero wagon was developed by Valerian Abakovsky in 1921, and he and eight Confederates died testing it. Unsurprisingly, that concept didn't catch on. Speaking of wrecks, there's one famous example you may have already seen, which is now owned by the historical Smoky Mountain Railway, a preservation society in Dillsborough, North Carolina. The CSX U18B 1901 was featured in the 1993 film The Fugitive, starring Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones. In the movie, the train strikes the prison bus that's transporting Ford's character, allowing him to escape. The scene's visceral sense of authentic danger is thanks to a real train and bus rather than miniatures. This was all in the days before CGI could have been used. Sixteen cameras captured the CSX striking the bus, which tore it in half, and explosive charges were placed along the rail lines to derail the engine. Cameras were placed in both vehicles, and only one shot used models, the one in which the train first makes contact with the bus. Obviously, uh, they couldn't have Harrison Ford jumping off the back of an actual bus being hit by a train, so these two shots were put together using models and a green screen. The film crew was only budgeted for this single attempt, which was a stunning success. If you'd like to visit the wreck, well, you absolutely can. The Preservation Society requested that it be left in place, and it's still a tourist destination to this day. Here's another movie scene. There's a cemetery of trains in the salt flats of Uyuni in Bolivia, in what looks like the perfect location for a Mad Max film. It's one of the oldest train yards in the world, with over a hundred rail cars all thoroughly rusted by the salty winds. Most of the trains in this graveyard originated in Britain in the early 20th century. They once served the Ferrocarril de Antofagasta a Bolivia, the first freight line in Bolivia hauling silver, gold, and other precious metals to ports on the Pacific Ocean. A collapse of the local mining industry in the 1940s saw most freight trains consigned to this desert wasteland. Today, Salar de Uyuni, the largest salt flat in the world, is a significant tourist destination, and the trains are enjoyed by thousands of tourists every year. Local legend even states that one of the trains, La Union, was held up by real-life outlaws Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid in 1908, though no proof of that has ever been found. If it exists, the famed Volbrisch Gold Train or Nazi Gold Train would be a valuable find. Legend says that during the last months of World War II, the Nazis loaded an armored train full of gold and other plundered treasures in Breslau, now Wroclaw. Its destination was Project Reis in the Owl Mountains. This was an unfinished system of tunnels and defensive works intended to serve as a final redoubt for Nazi Germany and Western Poland under Siege Castle. While the complex is there, unfinished, most historians now 
now consider the story to be apocryphal. Many similar trains did exist and delivered Nazi treasures to secure locations throughout the Reich, but none seems to have gone missing. The Polish government scoured the warrens of Reich and they never found anything. Still, rumors continue to circulate of deathbed confessions and government leaks, continually generating media attention and inspiring urban explorers to enter the abandoned tunnels illegally in search of the 300 tons of Nazi gold said to be in there. A media sensation flared up again in 2016 when the owners of a mine exploration company got permission from the Polish state railways to excavate a section of ground at kilometer 65 of the Wroclaw Walvrish rail spur. While there was some evidence of a potential collapsed tunnel, the digging halted when no rail tracks or sign of a train appeared. But it's all pretty good for the local economy. Of the whole affair, a spokesman for the mayor of the local town quoted in the New York Times saying, the publicity the town has gotten in the global media is worth around $200 million. Our annual budget for promotion is $380,000, so think about that. Whether the explorers find anything or not, the gold train has already arrived. Abandoned by a logging company in 1933, the Eagle Lake and West Branch engines stand today as a reminder of how quickly nature erases any sign of our presence. Today, the two engines, trucked inland to carry pulpwood logs to a paper mill by the upper Allagash River, occupy a short stretch of track deep in the woods of Maine. It's as if they appeared from nowhere, surrounded by now fully grown trees. These relatively new and pristine engines were abandoned when the logging company paused operations due to the Great Depression. By the time logging resumed, trucks were considered more economical and the engines were left to rust. The Forest Service removed their dangerous asbestos insulation in 1995 so new generations of tourists could enjoy the trains safely. This old veteran still has a chance at another life. A GG1 General Electric designed by Donald Donor and Raymond Lowy in the 1930s, this locomotive is one of only 139 originally produced. These beautiful Art Deco-inspired trains once ran on the Penn Central, Conrail, and Amtrak systems. The last one retired in 1983 after 50 years of service. 16 of them are in museums, and this example, sitting in Charlotte Valley, New York, is hopefully destined for a heritage railway owned by the Henry Ford Museum. Electric trains of the era were fast, reaching up to 100 miles per hour, 160 kilometers per hour. It was powered by 12 385 horsepower AC commuter motors, which have higher torque and speed than induction motors. A steam heater from the locomotive warmed the train's passenger carriages. This was the type of engine which hauled Robert F. Kennedy's funeral train from Penn Station, New York, to Washington, D.C. The Thessaloniki train cemetery was begun in the 1980s by the Hellenic Railways Organization, Greece's national rail company. The trains left in this yard are not among the most glamorous models in the world, but they are open to the public. Greece's unique and difficult geography always presented a challenge to railway engineers. In the early 20th century, a trip from Athens to Kalambaka, just 355 kilometers away, would have taken more than 24 hours. By 2010, the Greek national railways were deep in debt thanks to their exploding pension expenses. About 5% of the Greek GDP was owned by the railways. Economists argued that it had become cheaper to transport every railway passenger in Greece by private taxi than continue to operate the trains. Many lines were subsequently closed. These veterans represent a more optimistic era, when the Greek economy was booming in the 1970s and 1980s, when railways were expanding. Now, more than 30 years later, they serve as a reminder of better times. Here's a rail landmark you probably can't visit. It's the Istvan Telek train yard, also known to train spotters as the Red Star Graveyard. Sitting on a large plot outside of Budapest, Hungary, Istvan Telek is closed to the public. You'd need written permission from the government to visit, and that's probably because amongst the more than 100 locomotives and cars, there are said to be cattle cars and engines that once transported Jews, Roma, and Poles to the death camp at Auschwitz during the Second World War. Still visible at Istvan Teleka, trains bearing the red star of Stalin's USSR. Soviet passenger tickets from the 1960s are said to be scattered about some of the newer cars in the yard.
Speaking of the macabre, our last stop is a chilling reminder of the dangers of authoritarianism and ego. Nicknamed the Dead Road, the Selhard Igarka Railway is a chilling reminder of a dark period in human history. Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin personally commissioned this stretch of track as part of his Gulag Archipelago, which stretched from forced labor camps in central Russia to the nickel mines of Siberia, in which millions of Soviet citizens worked and died in horrifying conditions. The slave labor system of the Gulag primarily served as a means of dominating the Soviet population and terrorizing any political opposition. It was marked by foolhardy construction projects like Selhard Igarka, which cost the lives of thousands of workers who died of malnutrition or exposure to the Arctic conditions. The Dead Road was built to connect a planned deepwater port at the Gulf of Ob near Mies Kameny with the railways of the polar Ural region. This uh, would have provided rail access to the region from Moscow, providing a direct route from the capital to Siberia. Yet the project was a massive folly, marked by absurdity and death. After two years of construction, engineers discovered that the Gulf of Ob was too shallow for a deepwater port. So Stalin decided to extend the railway by land all the way to the city of Igarka, 906 miles, 1,459 kilometers away. A railway across permafrost is a stupendously bad idea. The frozen land shifts and flows over time, causing the lines to constantly bend back and forth, up and down, breaking just about everywhere. Where the tracks crossed rivers, cars were loaded onto ferries, and in winter, tracks would be laid across river ice. The Gulag workers who built the railway often worked without the benefit of heavy equipment, cutting logs by hand in the cold, all so that in a year or two the rail line would be unrecognizable and impassable yet again. Khrushchev axed the line immediately after Stalin died in 1953. It was an embarrassment to Soviet leadership that most people just wanted to quietly forget. 